In the last episode, we began the Chilean route of the parks, meeting with the conservation group Rewilding Chile and heading through Cerro Castillo National Park and down to the Marble Chapels. From there, I continued my journey by road along the narrow dirt road of the Carretera Austral to reach one of the other national parks started by the Tompkins, Patagonia National Park. Welcome back to Patagonia, friends. The adventures continue here along the route of the parks here in Chile and Patagonia. Right now, I'm in Park Patagonia, right in front of Explora Lodge, which is going to be my base of operations for the next few days. This hotel blends adventure with national park explorations. It's the only hotel in the park, and it is absolutely wonderful. Not only is it just a hotel, but you're paired with guides that take you on an adventure is to be able to see this national park through the eyes of explorers, conservationists, even some wildlife veterinarians. So it's a really special place to stay. This was one of the parks created by the Tompkins and Explora Lodge is such a special place because much like the Tompkins, they're also trying to conserve land. They have a goal of conserving 10 million hectares in the next 10 years. Right now they're at about a million and they've bought some land nearby this park, right outside Torres del Paine as well, but we'll be expanding that reach all across the world, trying to protect more and more land. Now, over the next couple of days, I'm gonna be exploring this park. As you can see, there's also already some wildlife here, some Wanakos, but I'm gonna be taking two full days here in the park to be able to explore this just wild landscape. Very different from the last park here along the route of the parks, but I'm gonna give you a quick room tour here at the lodge, and then we're gonna head off for some adventures. Explora Lodge is the only hotel inside Park Patagonia, offering exclusive access to the wildlife and landscape. The lodge itself is set in several buildings, blending into the natural surroundings, built with stone from local quarries and recycled wood with copper for the roofs, it was built with sustainability at the forefront. The rooms are spacious, feeling more like a private apartment than a hotel, and the grounds also feature a spa and hot tub, restaurant, bar and lounge, and of course, unparalleled access to adventure. The lodge is also located at the park information center and headquarters. So anyone coming into this park will pass through here. You can grab lunch, dinner, check out something at the store and get your entrance ticket to the park. Today is my first full day exploring this park, and you know we're starting off with a hike up to a place called Lago Chico. This is a pretty popular hike here in this park, and you're gonna be joined by my expert guide from Explora Poncho, who's gonna be pointing out some of the best things to take a look at here in the park. The landscape here could not have felt more different than Cerro Castillo, with huge rolling hillsides of grasslands that dipped into the valleys full of icy glacier water that always seemed to be the perfect shade of blue. We are just approaching Lago Chico. This hike has been absolutely beautiful. We've been hiking through the Lenga forest, but Years ago, this was actually all cut down for livestock, sheep, cattle, and these trees are now regrowing. It's just really incredible to see how much the forests and the grasslands here have regrown after years and years of animals being grazed in here. And the views along this hike have been incredible. There's a huge lake that we passed on the way up here. And we're off to this little lake behind me here at Lago Chico. Just amazing, I cannot wait to get down there. We are down walking around the lake now and this trail just goes right around the lake, all the way around. It's just absolutely beautiful. A perfect day today. This hike is a lot less strenuous than the one we did in Cerro Castillo. And in my opinion, a lot more beautiful too. 
It's called paramela, okay? And it's a plant with aphrodisiac uh, <laughs> like uh, characteristics. So like people make a tea? People or? make a tea or more than a tea, people put this in the mate. Do you know what mate Oh, in the mate, is? yes, yeah. I've had mate. Exactly. So if you touch it, it's very uh, like sticky and the flavor is very strong, like the smell is very, very strong. Oh, wow. Yeah. I would have it in my mate. Yeah. 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 And it is, yeah, it's, it's sticky. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's like glue. As we come around the bottom side of Lago Chico, we have these fantastic views of Lake Cochrane behind me. And like many afternoons here in Patagonia, the wind has picked up and it might just blow me away. <laughs> but we've got a couple more kilometers left to get around this lake. And it, man, is it beautiful. This is certainly the best lunch I've ever had on a hike. Yeah. <laughs> I don't usually stop for picnics. This is the last stop on our hike here at the Doug Tompkins Overlook, and it is spectacular. What a way to end the day, my first full day here in Patagonia National Park, and a beautiful one to end the day. The land here was once part of the region's largest sheep and cattle ranch, which operated for over a hundred years. Ranching had done a lot of damage to this landscape, not only driving out native animals, but degrading the grasslands and leaving many areas devoid of native plants. When we came into the park, I showed you some of the animals that love the healthy grasslands that this park has restored. And right now I'm standing in front of one of the pieces of farmland that still remains here in Park Patagonia. And you can see behind me just how unhealthy the ground is here. It is devoid of almost all the natural plants. And this is exactly what a restoration project like Park Patagonia has done. We're gonna walk through some healthy grasslands again so that you can see just how different it looks when you remove some of the livestock and bring in some of the healthy grazers that have brought this land back to life. Vast territories like this in Patagonia tend to be dotted with private enclosures and estates, some of which still dot the landscape within Park Patagonia. And this is an issue that many of the national parks here in Patagonia face. These large portions of land are often simultaneously the most productive and economically attractive, also offering some of the best potential for biodiversity and conservation. Their safeguarding, therefore, is critical as they cradle highly dynamic and fragile ecosystems that we need to protect.
Oh my goodness gracious, that was just incredible. You know, since coming down here to Patagonia, one thing I've wanted to see is a puma. And I know in America, we have this connotation that any mountain lion you see will kill you. It will think you're a deer or it will want you as prey. And down here, it is so different. There is a healthy number of pumas. There is a healthy amount of prey and the pumas just want to do puma things. So they aren't a threat to people and there haven't hasn't been an attack on a person in many, 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 many years down here. So seeing one of these has been highly on my list. And tonight I was just so lucky. I'd actually planned on after dinner, just going out on one of the hillsides here with some hot tea and my cameras and just waiting and hoping. And when I left dinner, I didn't even have to do that because there he was, this juvenile puma just hanging out, wandering around the fields. So got to take some pictures of him, got some videos of him as well. And it was just such an amazing experience. In saying that, I actually wanted to read you the card that I got when I checked in here at the lodge, which says, Projects such as the Patagonia National Park are beacons of hope for humans and wildlife alike, guiding us to become custodians and defenders instead of mere visitors. And I just love that so much. It really resonated with me. And over and over again, while I've been here in Patagonia National Park and Chile and Patagonia just as a whole, I have heard over and over again from the people that work in these parks from the people that work with the wildlife that they want people to come and have these experiences with wildlife because you can't protect a place until you love that place. If you don't see it with your own eyes, if you don't experience these fantastic moments that you can have when you come into these places, seeing the views, having experiences like I just had with that puma, then you won't want to protect it. So we need more people to have the opportunity to come and spend time in nature because that is what is going to make conservation and the successful integration of species back into the wild happen. And that's why I make this show so that people can fall as much in love with nature as I've fallen in love with it my entire life and continue to fall in love with it more and more every day and every place that I travel to. It is another beautiful start to the day here in Patagonia National Park. What a wonderful experience I had yesterday. And today we're heading out on two half day adventures with the Explora team, starting the day with a boat ride up some of the clearest waters in the world. Wildlife comes in all sizes here, and one of the species we just spotted is a little pygmy owl, and he is beautiful. One of the most important valleys here in the park is called the Chacabuco Valley. It has some of the most expansive grasslands and is home to several hiking trails, which I was traveling along today. Now the Tompkins visited this valley, the Chacabuco Valley, for the first time in 1995 and fell in love with Patagonia right here. Years later in 2004, they purchased this Estancia, starting years of conservation work that helped this become a national park in 2018.
One of the berries that grows in abundance down here is called Calafate, and it grows all along the roadsides here in Patagonia National Park. It looks a lot like a blueberry, but it's a lot more sour and a little bit more bitter. It has a teeny tiny seed inside. Not as tasty as a blueberry, still edible. And they make it into jams and jellies and liqueurs and all kinds of stuff that you will see all around in the gift shops in this area of Patagonia. This park is one of the largest grasslands restorations in the entire world. And when you reestablish those, species come back. One of the first ones to come back in this part of the world is this one behind me, the Wanako. Now, these are in the camelid species, very closely related to the llama. And since I love llamas and alpacas, I already love these guys too. They're pretty cool. They're just sitting out there sunbathing, enjoying the wonderful, delicious grass and having a great day. And I'm having a great day too. The Wanako aren't just fun to watch, but they're also one of the keystone species here. Feeding on 75% of all the plant species in the Patagonian steppe, they're great for dispersing seeds, fertilizing the ground, and they have high reproductive rates, providing food for large carnivores like Puma. One of the other really important projects that Rewilding Chile is doing here in this park is helping to protect the giant Andean condor. Now, this is the largest scavenger bird on Earth. They have a wingspan of up to 10 feet across. They can also live up to 70 years old. And this species has been brought to the brink of extinction and is just starting to be rehabilitated here. I've seen many flying the skies here in the park, which is a really good sign, but they're super important to the ecosystem. And here in Patagonia National Park, they actually have a rehabilitation center where there are a few Andean condors. We've been invited over there to take a closer look at these massive birds this morning, and I am really looking forward to seeing them. So the condor cage is actually just over my shoulder here, and I've met up with the team from Wee Wilding now. We're just making a very long and slow approach up to the cage because we don't want to disturb these animals. So we're trying to kind of sneak up on them so they don't see us approaching. Now, there are four birds here. Three of them were actually orphaned as chicks, and the fourth one was actually raised in captivity. They're all gonna be released in about a month back into the wild or into the wild for the first time for some of them. Condors are like lobsters. They mate for life. And they spend six to eight months just courting each other. A female has just one egg at a time that takes about 60 days to hatch. And then these little guys usually stay in the nest for six to eight months. So it's a long time, which means there's usually only one Andean condor born to a couple every two years, which is one of the reasons why reestablishing the population of these birds has been so difficult. Luckily, this is a wonderful place for condors. I've seen about a dozen over the last few days flying in the sky, and soon these guys will be joining all of the ones flying free. I love this lodge so much. I just got back from seeing the condors and stopped back by the lodge to fill up my water bottle. And they had made me a lunch to take with me on the road today. <laughs> love that so much. They have been just so amazing here at the lodge. And I am very sad to be leaving. But this has been an absolutely incredible experience here in Patagonia National Park. This is such an amazing place, Patagonia. I have had just the most wonderful time here and all these opportunities that I have been given to be able to meet up with Rewilding Chile, learn about the conservation work that they're doing, and learn more about these really unique species that are so important for the ecosystem here, like the Andean condor today, is just, I'm very fortunate. I pinch myself every day being able to 
be able to have these experiences and share them with you. The story behind the Andean condor, once you learn it, you really get a feel for the challenges that this species has had in surviving mankind, really, because for years and years here in the region of the Andes, people have poisoned livestock, dead livestock, and left it out to kill puma, to kill fox. And the Andean condor has been the unlucky recipient of a lot of that poison. One of the condor that we saw today in the cage recovering was actually recovering from being poisoned from an animal carcass. So there's all these things that affect the species. And I don't think people realize that when they try to get rid of one thing, it has this grave effect on so many other things, so many other species. And because the Andean condor takes a really long time to mate, a really long time to have young and only has one egg at a time every maybe two years at best, it takes a really long time for this species to repopulate. And it's really nice here to see so many flying in the skies and programs like this that are trying to bring back this population of Andean condors because it is really important to the ecosystem. But it's also really expensive, you know, rewilding, rehabilitating species that humans have brought to the edge of extinction is not an easy feat. It's not done quickly. And a lot of the times it's not very newsworthy, but it's so important. And I hope that in watching this video, if you didn't already understand how important it is to conserve species, to protect the landscapes, I hope this gave you a little bit more of an inside picture into why it's important to do these things. Ecosystems like this, before it was brought back, as you saw when we walked through that farm, the land was just devoid of almost anything. And look at what it looks like when it's healthy. Just incredible. And I hope you guys have enjoyed exploring Patagonia National Park with me. I've got more to come from this beautiful region of the South. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button, give this video a thumbs up, and I will see you in the next video.